people blocking streets, people saying we will not collaborate with the government. The banks are closed, the shops are closed, the civil servants are closed, the local governments are closed, and this is bringing the military to its knees, and we think it is fantastic and want to encourage everyone to continue. The boycott campaign has been incredibly effective. You go to any tea shop, in Mandalay or Yangon or anywhere in the country and you ask for Red Ruby cigarettes and a little boy like this will come to you and say, no brother, don't buy those cigarettes, they're from the military. All over the country, whether it's plastics companies, whether it's cigarettes, whether it's Myanmar beer, they're getting smashed in the street because the military should not be rewarded and people should not buy those products and we will continue to boycott and thank you to everyone in Myanmar who's boycotting those products. Give them a huge round of applause. Thank you. Jamie Parker, the Greens MP for Balmain, has been one of the more popular Australian speakers at the various demonstrations against the military coup in Myanmar that have been held in Sydney over the last month. I spoke to him about how he became involved with Burmese issues and his views on the unfolding resistance to the coup. So Jamie, tell us a little about the history to your connection with the Burmese cause. Well, when I was 16 years old, I was uh, trekking in the mountains of the Thai Burma border. My dad worked at Qantas, he fixed engines there. And so we had discounted airfares and I'd saved up for a long time and I went overseas and I went to Thailand and trekked around the Thai Burma border and met Burmese people. Um, and obviously I heard about 1988 and what had happened there, it was just fresh. And when I came back to Australia, I didn't really have much of a connection until I met Burmese people. Uh, when I was uh, involved in student politics here in Australia, who'd come to Australia post-88. And uh, many of those students are great friends of mine, even today. So that got me very involved in the Burma cause. Uh, I organised, was one of the founding members of the Australian Coalition for Democracy in Burma, countless meetings, rallies, protests, lobbying, federal government. And uh, since the uh, by-election and then the election in 2015, I was there as an observer. Um, I've been very involved in Burma. I go to Burma just about every year. Um, and it's a place that I love and I work a lot in, in communities. Uh, especially around the political organising and solidarity work both here and in Burma and it's something I'm very passionate about. At Saturday's rally you called out the Australian government for doing next to nothing uh, since the, the, the coup in, in Myanmar, even less than the Biden administration. They've essentially done nothing. They've made some statements but they haven't done as much as Biden has done in US, even though that's not very much. They haven't done as much as the EU. They haven't done as much as the UK. Australia needs to step up and not just say we don't like this coup, but take action and take action straight away. What do you think is the reason for this tardiness to act quickly, to isolate, to, to, to cut links with the, with the military junta? I think there's a few different factors. Uh, I mean, it's shameful really that Australia is behind Biden and Boris Johnson in the UK, uh, who've both implemented targeted sanctions against military generals and uh, leaders. I think there's a few reasons. First of all, Australia has some very significant economic interests in the country. Um, and you could see the fact that Auscham, the Australian Chamber of Commerce, was one of only two chambers of commerce out of all of them in Burma to not sign a open letter opposing the crackdown. Uh, that was very important. You know, uh, every other country, America, all the EU countries, uh, India, other chambers signed, but Australia didn't, along with Hong Kong. Um, so there's economic interests. I think that the Australian Liberal Party is reluctant um, to engage in that kind of what they see as interference. I think they're less ambitious about the role that Australia can play in the area, and they're more laissez-faire about it. I think also the military to military ties that Australia has over many, many years has meant that there was a less um, robust response. And finally, uh, it's pretty clear that the Australian ambassador in Burma was very close to the um, economic uh, relationship, you know, with the Australian companies and so on. So our ambassador was probably less enthusiastic about being strong. 
And all of those things combined means Australia has been one of the least uh, responsive to not only the coup, but the uh, murderous killing spree that the police and military have now uh, entered into. Maurice Payne announced on Sunday night um, that they were suspending the military cooperation with Myanmar. Do you see this as a response to the, the pressure that has been put on the government over this question? Oh yes, it's clear that the pressure has been significant. Uh, we've seen, um, as I mentioned, the EU, the United States, the UK do more than Australia has even said they would consider. There's been very significant protest action. There's been a lot of lobbying in Canberra from uh, Burmese community representatives, but also groups like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty and Action Aid. And the capitulation of Woodside was important. Uh, Woodside, as you know, has an exploration license and has spent tens of millions of dollars in the country. And they initially said, oh, you know, the country's going through a transition. Um, and then when the response from the MUA, from unions, uh, from uh, Action Aid, Amnesty and the Burmese community, a 3,000 strong rally in Perth, uh, Woodside capitulated. And the fact that they withdrew, I think, also uh, assisted the government in being able to say, well, we'll take some action as small as it is. So at the rally on Saturday, uh, you were very positive about the, the, the resistance to the coup. You know, they carried out strikes, they carried out um, mass rallies, sustained mass rallies. Um, what's behind this, this energy that's, uh, that's driving this ongoing protest? Well, it's remarkable that this protest movement has been so effective. Mass strikes, um, even today, banks, private banks still have not opened. Um, and the boycott movement against militaries companies has been uh, universally embraced. Uh, and what's behind it? It's clear that people not only feel that they've had their democracy stolen from them, but their futures. Um, they've had a taste of democracy, a taste of being able to express themselves after a generation of military dictatorship and before that, you know, a history of colonial oppression. And now they've been able to express themselves politically, economically, um, socially, and that has now been crushed by the military and by the police. So, you know, this sense of solidarity, the sense of community action is something which has come from uh, the huge loss that people are feeling, the grief that they're feeling about what's being stolen from them. But more importantly, it speaks of the connections that exist in that society. People know the people who live in their streets. They know the people in their township. There's a sense of solidarity which is now being expressed incredibly powerfully and I think probably amongst the strongest we've seen in the world. Um, to see this type of action day in, day out striking and the CDM, civil disobedience movement, is truly remarkable. People going to the houses of those civil servants that are striking, bringing them food, supporting them, giving them some money. There's a real sense of uh, neighbour to neighbour support uh, to back the CDM protesters, and that is something which is really incredible. Given given this huge response, um, what uh, what what prospect do you think there is for this uh, this resistance sparking off a broader Asian Spring? You know, there's Thailand next door, which is mm. in the midst of a struggle, and obviously there's Hong Kong. Uh, what are the prospects for for Burma kicking off an Asian Spring? Well, there's been a real symbiotic relationship between all those campaigns. And so much of what is being acted out today in, on the ground, they've learnt from Hong Kong activists, they've learnt from Thai activists, solidarity messages from Thai activists, solidarity messages from Burmese activists, that building sense that people are not alone, you know, jammed into nation states, but we're all part of a bigger campaign for democracy and human rights and freedom. So I think there's something really genuinely um, appearing there. Obviously we know other countries, Cambodia, there's been a long struggle as difficult as it is for democratic representation. We see the same in Laos, we see the same throughout the region, it's incredibly difficult. But I think there is something very special going on and I can see it mobilising other activists, for example, with the establishment of this ASEAN MPs Group for Human Rights. Uh, and we saw at the last ASEAN meeting only four out of the ten spoke out strongly. Uh, to support the reinstallation of democratic civil government there. And that's something I think those countries, Singapore, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, these countries are starting to speak out and 
instead of just being stuck in their own countries, they're now mobilising across the region. That's a very good sign. I think the prospects are very positive for an increase in the amount of mobilisation uh, domestically in these countries that have suffered so long to be able to speak out and stand up for human rights, for democracy and, and, and a, a government that represents them. Now, during the, um, the previous uh, NLD civilian government, um, a lot of international support was lost around its, um, its inability or failure to take up uh, the military during the uh, Rohingya genocide. What prospects are there for uh, a reconciliation uh, with the Rohingya and other ethnic minorities um, coming out of this struggle against the military coup? Well, it's really interesting that the Rohingya groups, the representative groups, have obviously called for the military to withdraw because they know that the situation is even worse than it was under the NLD government with the military in full control. You know, it's difficult to talk about this in a positive way, but potentially uh, there is a positive silver lining to this. This will accelerate the democratisation. For example, the 2008 constitution, which you know was rigged by the military, the referendum, gave them 25% of the seats in parliament and a whole lot of other privileges. Now people are saying, we're not going to go back to that. The NLD tried to accommodate the military and tried to have a kind of balancing act with them, saying, we'll take the 2008 constitution, we'll try and work with you. But now the call is to abolish that absolutely and to really drive the military back. That's a good sign for uh, ethnic groups. Um, and it's a good sign for the development of a democratic system, a truly, or more democratic system there. I think there's also a really interesting breakthrough with the CRPH, which is the committee representing the parliament, made up of all the MPs that were legitimately elected in November and 2020. They've established a committee representing that parliament and they're in the process of establishing a national unity government, a union government, for the first time genuinely including ethnic parties in that process. And that to me will be in the next week or two a very important time because if that can be established with the major ethnic political parties, it will make a decisive break from the past where it's always been about the NLD with you know a few other ethnic parties maybe supporting them. But if there can be a genuine coming together of these parties during this time of adversity, it could actually be a really positive thing and a positive step forward because the future of Burma has to be a united federal union. And that is what the ethnic groups are arguing so hard for, the, EA, the ethnic armed organisations, EAOs, and that's what needs to happen to bring the country together and recognise that you know everyone it needs to share a part of this country. And I'll just say one other thing as well. Let's not forget that we're seeing killings and murders on the streets of Yangon, but that has been going on in Karen-controlled areas, in ethnic areas for decades. The killing, raping, burning of villages, but it's just been out of sight. We saw it as well in for the Rohingya people. So let's not be uh, under any illusion that the military hasn't been doing this for a generation. But we're just seeing it now because it's in Yangon and it's so obvious. So we need to acknowledge that these ethnic groups in particular have suffered so terribly under the military and it's time not just to roll back their coup but to roll back their influence completely. People have remarked on the, on the leading role of a, of a very a new generation of activists. So you have this new millennial uh, style protest and at least from the outside, it, it, it looks a lot more internationalist. It looks a lot less confined by national identity and culture. Do you think this could have a positive impact on, on the reshaping uh, of, of the country uh, that takes into account the need for, for, for regional autonomy, for accommodating uh, mm. the different ethnic groups? I think you're absolutely right. And a, a little insight into that is I was at the rally Make, shouting some slogans in Burmese, and one of the young people came to me and said, brother, they're 1988 slogans. We need 2020 slogans, 2021 slogans. And we were talking about the new slogans coming from the young people, from the youth in the community. Obviously, people like Minko Nai are leading uh, covertly through Facebook and social media, 88 generation, but there's now a new generation. And we see that at our own protests here in Sydney. Uh, young people who have tasted half of their lifetimes as a democracy, uh, who are educated, who are informed, who are part of 
you know, the, the world. That's why they're studying here and studying all around the world. And their influence is really important. You can see it here, even in Sydney, when the Burmese community meets. The young people have a very different attitude. They're not so worried about sectarian views or different ethnic groups. We're all in this together. We're all in this together. We need to accept everyone, include everyone, and recognise we all have a role to play. And that is very, very important. And I think these young people as well, um, for example, you see them on the streets, LGBTI campaigners carrying their rainbow flags in Yangon. I mean, it's punishable by, uh, homosexuality is punishable by very long prison terms under the old colonial laws that still exist in Burma. All these different communities are now coming to the fore, showing the diversity of the community domestically, but also their engagement politically around the world. I think it augurs very well for the future, and we need to be hearing those younger voices. And we can hear them just by tuning into social media and seeing the Burmese student organisations. And that's, of course, why the ABFSU, the All Burma Federation of Student Unions, all their leadership have been arrested. One of the first groups the military went for was the ABFSU, trying to get the young people. But their resilience is incredible, and they're the ones on the front line in Yangon, Mandalay, all around the country. And they're giving us a very important lesson of how we can be organising cooperatively and collectively. Thank <laughs> you.